very much, Mary, and uh, welcome to everybody to uh, this one-hour presentation on emerging trends in office ergonomics. And with me, I have a colleague, Jamie Mallon, Human Tech. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Mallon, and I'm uh, Executive Vice President at Human Tech. And uh, Kevin, obviously, a senior consultant here at Human Tech. And we're going to trade off quite often, uh, keep this presentation moving uh, smoothly for you. And uh, actually, we're, I think we're going to start off with a, with a poll to uh, figure out who we've got on the phone. Yeah, now that you know a little bit about us, uh, what we would like to do just to gauge our audience here is to uh, indicate to us what is your level of involvement with the ergonomic aspects of the workplace. Um, we're interested in knowing if you are not really responsible for any uh, type of ergonomic activities, minor responsibility, major responsibility, or for some of you out there, maybe uh, a big part of your life. Um, so there should be a poll opening up for you here, and if you could just take a few moments to select the best fitting answer. What would you answer, Kevin? Yeah, it's a big part of my life. <laughs> see how our answers pop up. And this just helps us gauge our, our pace of presentation and, and what we're going to really focus in on. And I know that uh, a lot of a lot of involvement with uh, facility management and layout and design um, can really range in what type of uh, activity is needed in terms of um, involvement from very early stages um, of setting up a facility to day-to-day -day activities of, of monitoring the, the equipment uh, and procurement. Um, and so depending on what your role and responsibility is, we, we were expecting that there would be quite a, a wide range of, of responses here. Yeah. Well, let's see what the results are when, we, when they come through. We'll go back to them. But if we want to move on to today's agenda, keep the uh, presentation going. I see that a lot of folks are uh, continuing to log in, so no worries. You haven't uh, missed only uh, the introductions, really, of Kevin and myself. We're going to cover uh, six items. Um, you know, we want to get a good understanding of today's office workforce and what's, what's changed. Um, understanding how those changes have maybe created some more challenges for us in terms of managing uh, ergonomics in the office. Spend a little bit of time on some uh, facts and, and fads in terms of uh, standing workstations versus seated workstations versus sort of alternative seating uh, opportunities. Obviously, one of the big changes for everybody is, is the aging workforce. I mean, I think we're all, well, every day we get older. Uh, the fifth thing we're going to cover is Taking you through a very simple process to set up your workstations and a way of thinking about the office workstation in a, in a very simplified format. And finally, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how technology might be able to help us uh, manage ergonomics better. But when I think about um, you know today's office workforce, you know I like to go backwards a little bit and let's start in the 80s. And uh, I know probably there are several people who were facility managers in the 80s. Um, on the call today. We had bad style, we had some good movies, uh, music was a little questionable, uh, it was the beginning of uh, the Macintosh, uh, Apple's first computer. And, and when I think about ergonomics, you know, you know, we were really in a, in a state of denial. We were, we were stuck with furniture that perhaps had been in our offices for 10 or 15 years and ergonomics really wasn't considered in that sort of 70s, 80s time frame. We were in denial that this was an issue. Um, in fact, I can recall um, ergonomics being this new, what would, would, many would consider this new field um, for the office in that time frame. And as we progressed into the 90s, you know, fashion got a little bit different, obviously. Music got, I think, a lot better. And uh, technology started to come across. I mean, that's when Google started, was in the 90s. And that's when laptops really started to show themselves in the workplace. Um, well, in terms of ergonomics, it really became about equipment. You know, the big, uh, the big five furniture manufacturers really started to talk about ergonomics. They started to design uh, their products so that they could be more adjustable. 
uh, ergonomics started to be slapped on uh, almost every piece of marketing material possible. And also in the 90s, we, we started to talk about an ergonomic standard, which was obviously passed by uh, the Clinton administration and then pulled back by the Bush administration. But nonetheless, there was a big advancements in our the equipment that we used, the equipment that we had at our disposal, and offices really started to change in, the, in how they looked. In the 2000s, well, you know, technology continued to change. We've got, uh, you know, music made changes, and all of a sudden we start to see these mobile phones, these mobile smartphones start to really appear and, and, and change perhaps how we, we interact with the office, uh, how we can't not interact with the office. And in terms of ergonomics, you know, there was a lot of people who knew about it. Uh, it became uh, even more of a buzzword. And I think companies and businesses really had to focus on a process to manage these improvement ideas, manage this, this furniture, manage who gets what, when. And it really did become about process. And when we talk about process, Kev, I'm sure you're aware, our business at that time in the, in the uh, early 2000s and, and a lot of our uh, competitors were doing a lot of face-to-face -face ergonomic assessment. I, I can certainly attest to that. Uh, definitely everybody enjoyed having uh, someone from the outside or an internal expert that was up to speed on the subject matter and uh, give them that one-on-one -on -one opportunity. But uh, it became exhausting after a while when you had several hundred office assessments to meet with people on a daily basis. And I would say that most of the problems were a repeat of the same problem over and over and over again. And if you think about it from a facilities management standpoint, we like our offices to look congruent. They like to look homogeneous. Everyone has the same color, the same layout, the same furniture. So if we make perhaps a little bit of a mistake at the beginning in the, in the specification um, phase of our project, Man, that's just going to spin and spin and spin. The nice thing about that, that period of time in, in the 2000s was that we really started to understand that ergonomics in the office isn't that complex. There's, there's only so many problems that, that can appear, and there are very well-known solutions. And we'll, we'll talk more about them in, in a little while. As I mentioned, in the 2000s, we started to see the advancements in mobile technology, and, and I think we started to move around quite a bit. And so in the 2010s, man, if you, you can recognize uh, the movie, uh, the picture of George Clooney, that's uh, the movie Up in the Air. And I think many people are starting to feel like that. Uh, they live out of a suitcase. They, their workstations are airports, airplanes, restaurants, hotels, client sites. Um, but we're really about being connected. What this mobile technology has allowed us to do is uh, maybe work a little more on our terms, but I don't think we're working any less. Kev, are you working any less? No, I agree. <laughs> and Facebook and LinkedIn has created these networks of people that we can respond to and work with and communicate with. And you know, we're much more connected. And technology is only going to further connect people across greater and greater distances. And, and we, can, we can use that to our advantage. Um, but when you think about it, what, is this, what has this done for us? Well. You know, we've got these great private offices, um, and we've got perhaps great furniture in those private offices. But, you know, a statistic from Herman Miller, you know, 77% uh, of, sorry, private offices are un unoccupied 77% of the time. It's a huge amount of time for that office and that great workstation layout to be empty. And why is it empty? Well, because we're meeting or we're connected by our mobile technology or we have a laptop and we're we're working from home. There's lots of different reasons why those private offices are unoccupied. You know, and the other thing is, is that our in, our um, organizations have made investments in very nice, in some cases, beautiful, open public spaces, and that's encouraging collaboration, encouraging people to work in in slightly different ways. I mean, again, that mobile technology and allowing us to do that to the point that cubicle or workstation utilization peaks at 10.30 in the morning, and it peaks at 10.30 in the morning at 30%. So man, we've got a lot of people who are never at their desks, but they're still working. And that, that causes a couple of issues for us. It causes us an issue in terms of what sort of accessories and, and, and equipment and furniture do we have to provide 
our employees, but from an ergonomic assessment or a process standpoint, where are these people? We can't meet them face to face. How are we going to really manage this well? And I've got a, several colleagues that will attest that they spend most of their time uh, hunting people down to do assessments rather than actually actually doing the assessment. And again, this laptop technology uh, is more and more pervasive. It's great stuff. They were reliable. They, they're portable. We can go anywhere with them. In fact, they're they're going to outpace desktop sales three to one. And what that's really also showing us is it's giving people more and more opportunity to work where they want. In fact, 10 the U.S. Census Bureau says that 10 percent of employees work from home full-time now in 2010, and that's, that's on the rise. So what it's really going to become about, I think, in the 2010s as we go further into this decade, is empowering people and understand, helping them understand how to, how to set themselves up properly, solve their own issues, provide them access to accessories. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, about that later. But more and more about this, this challenge, you know, what, what is this really going to do for us well, let's let's talk about that workforce and what's changed, Kev. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, point and trend as well, Jamie. Uh, what you're seeing on your screen here uh, is a breakdown of the percentage of, of workers um, that are either uh, working at a workplace um, or at home. And, and this uh, data came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And on the, the bars that are blue colored on your left-hand side, that's the percentage of workers at the job and on the right hand side or the red bars is the percentage of workers at home. And what's interesting about this is that there is roughly 25% of the working population that is now working at home. Uh, and for and, some period of their day or of their week, yeah. Yeah, and so we need to be able to uh, consider the challenges that they may be faced with and what are the accommodations that may be required. And so coming back to Jamie's comment about why do we need to provide this empowerment, well, you know, if we look at the demographics of our workers, there's really two main categories, uh, the home officer and the out of officer. So your home officer, uh, also known as the teleworker or telecommuter, um, someone who is working from a designated workspace uh, either at their home or their customers and they're typically communicating via uh, phone or email. You also have your flexible workforce. Uh, where it gives them the flexibility to change the time and or place that they're performing their work. When we talk about the out of officer, this is someone who is completing their, their office work or their job tasks in a variety of settings and um, some of you can attest to uh, uh, the various environments that range from hotels, airports, airplanes, uh, you know, train stations. We can really try to get work done anywhere possible. So these are two new types of workers, people who we have our standard traditional workers who work in the workplace, and then these two other sets, the home officer and the out of officer who are who are very rarely in the office or a portion of their time is spent at the workplace. So on that note, what we thought we'd like to do is uh, give a poll uh, a try here again, and uh, roughly what percentage of your workforce are home officers or out of officers? Either none, less than 10%, 10 to 25 percent or greater than 25 percent of your workforce. So take a moment there to identify which of the options you think are most suitable. Just Kev, for our company, we're greater than 50 percent are out of officers or home officers. Absolutely. I think about that. It's, you know, that creates an interesting move. So we know how to sort of work this relationship from a facilities and equipment standpoint, not only from a consulting or scientific uh, foundation, but from an experience one, too. Never thought of that. I think I've even got it figured out to how many pillows I need to sit on the Hampton Inn chairs to get myself at a comfortable working height. <laughs> cool. Well, let's see what these, uh, Mary, can you forward us the results of the poll, and we'll see how. They should be up. <clears throat> Do you see them? Um, it says that 35%, there's 0% said none, 35% said less than 10%, 45% said 10 to 25%, and 20% of people said greater than 25%. Okay, well, good. So, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly uh, on the right track in terms of folks uh, having this challenge or this aspect of their 
their work is really going to be out of the office. And, and if we take a look at the home officer, for instance, um, you're looking at them really falling into four categories. You've got the um, teleworkers, so the out of officers we talked about, or the home officers. We have day extenders, and I think we're possibly all in that category where we're doing a little bit of work at home every day, whether that be phone calls on our smartphone, answering emails on our smartphones, or, or, or maybe finishing up a little project because we had to get home and pick up our, our child from daycare, and we, we just didn't finish the deadline. So we also have you know, you got 12 million entrepreneurs out there who work mostly from home, and you got people who have a secondary job. That's 9 million people. You've got 83 million people or so who, who are home officers, and I... I, I would dare say that when business managers think about home officers, they might get a get a picture of this, right? Uh, Kevin, you're just sitting on the beach working. I don't know how hard you're working. I don't know where you're working. And, and we just get these, maybe these not negative connotations. And that's just not the facts. The facts are that people work actually better in these flexible situations. The problem is, is that when the, the atmosphere they're working in isn't this comfortable beach setting it tends to be something like the kitchen table uh, or, you know, Kev's office. Oh, thanks for throwing that in there, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so we've got good stuff. It's, no, it's not really set up properly or set up well. So when I think about the home officer, there are some essential, essential pieces of equipment that they need to have. And just because your laptop uh, computer has a monitor and has a keyboard and has a, input device or a mouse uh, trackpad doesn't mean that it's really set up for you. So if you're going to have extended use, um, I really push people to have an external keyboard and an external mouse to help them at least be able to, be able to get some distance between their monitor uh, and their keyboard. And that sets up a much better posture for the neck, which is the number one problem with, with laptops is you tend to put them on your lap or you tend to put them on a desk and, and look down at them all the time. So if I've got a keyboard or a mouse, then I can put my laptop screen up on a, who knows, man, a, a pile of phone books, if you've got phone books anymore, or a couple of reams of paper to get it up to the right height. We've got two different types of keyboards. Kev, is there any fact or fiction to this as well? Yeah, I would imagine a lot of you on there are probably wondering, are we going to comment on this? And uh, Yes, the, the ergonomic keyboards or split keyboards have definitely uh, been proven over and over again in various studies that it does promote improved working postures, uh, particularly for the hands and wrists. There's less side-to-side -side bending of the hand and wrist or ulnar radial deviation uh, if, you, if you're going for technical. Uh, but the other interesting finding that they, they tend to consistently discover is that there really is no change in performance, whether you're using the, the standard keyboard or the split keyboard. There was a lot of connotation that perhaps it would slow me down and make it more difficult to use. Um, but the studies have shown that there's the same level of performance. Regarding the various mice or, or, or mousing uh, opportunities that exist out there, you know, the, the fundamental difference between, say, a, a traditional mouse where your palm is flat down on it versus, say, a vertical mouse, such as what you're seeing on the screen here, uh, is that it really promotes using different muscle groups in your upper extremities. So uh, if you're someone that is experiencing perhaps, you know, discomfort or pain in your hand and wrist while using a traditional mouse, uh, that's usually a result of a lot of hand and wrist motions left to right uh, sides. What a vertical mouse will do is actually promote more uh, movement to being generated from the shoulder area. And so that's pulling in larger muscle groups and it's going to uh, take some of that strain off the smaller ligaments and tendons in the hands and wrists. It also puts the hands, uh, wrists, elbows in a neutral position for while you're grasping that mouse. So, you know, uh, at the very least provide them a, a mouse, but try to think about these vertical, uh, vertical mice as, a, as another option. I think another essential for the home officer is, if you can, is an external monitor. You know, um, External monitors, obviously, it can be larger than that laptop mount, uh, screen. External monitors uh, are generally of a better quality. Um, and you know what? I can use two now. I can use the monitor from my laptop and the monitor that you've provided me. So, I, hey, that means double the work, right, Kev? Of course. <laughs> but no, seriously, you, you have better access to information and, 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 can, and have things more, more things going on at once if you, 
to have this sort of sort of situation. So at least one, uh, if not uh, a device that allows you to utilize the laptop uh, monitor as well as an external monitor. The other thing I think, and it's not essential, but would be nice for the home officer, is these, these sit-stand sort of uh, pieces of equipment. And there are several on the market. Um, the key is that they are, that the monitor stand and the keyboard support are independently adjustable, so you can get the right proportions in the right places. Um, so this is one um, that's available from Health Postures. I think it's a good one, but, you know, we also have this. Uh, sit stand, which allows someone to go seated or standing very simply, very easily, and uh, it works very, I think, uh, very simply for the individual as well. Again, these are uh, nice to dos that you might want to consider, or if, if perhaps we have a, a couple of people on the call who help uh, entrepreneurs who work from home, you know, this is a, this is a very nice solution. But we've got this other group of people we want to talk about also, which is this out of officer, and this is again a, a picture from the movie uh, Up in the Air with George Clooney. It's one of my favorite movies because I lived that life for so long. But, um, you know, when we think about that out of officer, you know, anyone who doesn't travel for a living, anyone who, who doesn't uh, travel regularly, uh, gets the sense that uh, every trip is like a vacation. And I got to tell you, I wish it was. Uh, fact of the matter is, it is not generally as nice as this, uh, as this scene is. A lot of time on airplanes and a lot of time uh, being in odd and awkward uh, positions. Um, the other thing about the uh, awkward positions is they're not just in the airplane. You'll find similar setups in hotels. They generally don't have the stuff you need. They're getting better and better, I'll tell you that. They're starting to really uh, listen to the market and say, hey, we need better uh, working opportunities or working solutions in the hotel room. But generally, you're still working off that laptop. You're still working off uh, working off a uh, standard desk, and, and you obviously don't have an external monitor to bring with you. So some essentials for the out of officer, you know, uh, go with a portable split keyboard um, and a, and an external mouse. And the nice thing about these two, as opposed to the the, the larger ones, is that they are meant to be portable. They're meant to travel. Um, so they're a bit smaller, a bit lighter, and they tend to be wireless, which is even more important uh, when you're a traveling person. The second piece of uh, equipment is this laptop stand on the right side of the screen. This is great, and you see how it's utilized uh, underneath. Uh, you'll see that it props up that monitor, and you can now, with the adjustment of the um, opening and closing of the laptop itself and the adjustments that the laptop stand provides, get it to the right height. And now you've, you've sort of defeated that looking down posture all the time. Some other things you might want to consider uh, to help out. Now, these aren't absolutes for the out of officer. But, uh, you know, let's look at giving them those spinner wheel luggage. Um, much better than the standard pull or the even more standard carry uh, that, luggage. That has changed my life experience going through airports, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you're not dragging it. You get a lot better position. You get a lot better control. It's a lot easier. The other is to have a backpack for the laptop. Obviously, carrying uh, laptops around, <coughs> excuse me, and all the devices can be difficult. And think about those TSA-friendly bags as well. Um, saves people a lot of time when they're traveling. <coughs> but you know, the other thing to think about with ergonomics is just because it says ergonomic doesn't mean it is. Um, you, you really got to look at equipment and evaluate it properly to make sure that. It can be used simply, and it can be used appropriately, uh, given uh, given what the uh, what the application is. Now, there that, this sort of leads into our next topic is you know are there any fads or facts out there, and what's the deal with with standing versus sitting versus alternative seating? And I'll turn that back over to Kevin for a little while. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie. Uh, a well popular question that we get quite often, and uh, as it relates to standing. Uh, you know, it's interesting that on average we will sit 14 hours and 39 minutes per day. And most of that time uh, that we are sitting uh, is associated with, with being at work. Um, now there are a multitude of studies that have shown that, you know, prolonged sitting is associated with increased rates of cardiovascular events, uh, increased obesity, body mass index, uh, even type 2 diabetes. Uh, and, and to the extent of, of vein thrombosis, or better known as blood clots. 
Um, and so what really is uh, a better way to go about this? The, the one, the amalgamation of all those studies that I saw most recently in a newspaper article was that uh, they equated uh, sitting all day, every day, with smoking cigarette, a pack of cigarettes a day. Same kind of health impact uh, to the individual. So I try to stand more. <laughs> and yet we're both sitting down during this presentation. Yeah, we gotta What's wrong up. with we got to stand up. <laughs> well, to that effect, uh, what's interesting about the figure you're seeing now is um, the impact that a, a standing versus a seated position will have on the disc pressure uh, in your spinal column. And so if you were to look at bar A, which is representing someone standing upright, that represents 100% of disc compression or natural disc compression. But as you sit down, that disc compression will increase you know, by 50% which is relatively similar to standing upright bent over. Uh, and then if you were to sit down in a chair but slouch forward, as I'm sure many of us look like at the end of the day, uh, that, that pressure on the spinal discs increases uh, even more so. So in terms of fad versus fact, uh, really the, the best situation is going to be able to find a mix between sitting and standing. We know that standing burns 40 more percent uh, of calories. Uh, over two and a half hours, that's, that's about burning 350 calories or 20 pounds a year. Uh, studies show that if you're able to stand at your workstation, there's more productivity, there's increase in concentration, but there is also the uh, effects of uh, musculoskeletal disorders from prolonged standing to the legs, the knees, and uh, that's because of uh, increased tension in the muscles uh, and also poor blood flow. So really the, the, the best secret here is to find a mix between both of those postures. Now there is not enough evidence between sitting or standing alone as it relates to low back pain. So that hasn't been able to be concluded. Um, so again, providing both options and limiting the amount of time that you stand prolonged throughout the day or sitting prolonged is going to give you the best benefits possible. Another popular question that Jamie and I often come across is, hey, I've got this new uh, uh, floating ball or uh, the sitting kneel station, uh, and what should I be providing for my workers? Well, there really, in a, a study in 2006, there was really no uh, conclusive evidence that there is an increase in muscle activation in the low back while sitting on this ball or the exercise ball or the sit kneel stand. The big thing that you need to consider here is that if I'm sitting on a ball or uh, on that sit kneel stand is I really have no lumbar support and that's a very important feature um, of a chair and, and its appropriate design. The other factor to consider as well is that that exercise ball or kneeling chair doesn't really provide any adjustability. So you cannot change the seated height uh, to accommodate your working posture and or the equipment you're interacting with. So the key thing here to remember is that you must have a strong core if you are sitting on a soft and or unsupported surface and that adjustability of those key workstation components is crucial to making sure that you can match the, the workstation to the person as much as possible. So the conclusion of the Swiss ball office seating and those kneeling seated chairs is that those are fads and providing workers with a fully adjustable chair that is graded uh, for the weight of the person. Uh, is going to be your best bet and we're going to come back to this again in a later section to, to review what the key adjustability features should be and how to use them. So now I'd like to jump into uh, a conversation about the aging workforce because I know that uh, this is obviously on, on everybody's minds and I'll let Jamie introduce us to a little bit more about this topic. Yeah, um, you know, there are several non-occupational risk factors that, that contribute to the occurrence of an injury. So there's the, the occupational risk factors, so the things that are present in the workplace, uh, the risks that are present uh, in the equipment or in the operation itself, and then there's non-occupational risk factors, which, which tend to focus around the individual or the, or the person's uh, characteristics. And they include having previous conditions or injuries, um, their habits, their work habits, but also their at-home habits, uh, their gender, male and females have slightly different uh, proneness to, to injuries. Um, physical fitness overall is, has an impact and, and their weight has a, has a 
certainly has a carry some uh, some influence. Um, and all of these are really pushing us towards you know that wellness and why we see wellness really pushing um, through in a lot of corporate initiatives. You know, we have our insurance companies are getting after us and offering us uh, discounted rates if we start to really incorporate a full wellness program and based on participation. The, the rate will uh, will decrease. But one thing that's in here is, is age and how old people are. And you know, when we think about how old people are, it's, it's not just that old people or older people um, are more prone to injury. It's not. It's not just that, and it's not what you think the age is when someone becomes considered a, an aging population or an aged worker. Um, let's go to some very very quick state uh, stats. You know, this is well worth considering because by 2030. 20% of the population will be 65 years or older. And that has a huge impact on us as a labor market. 20, in 20 years, 20% 20 of our population isn't going to be able to work. And we just don't have the employees to fill that gap. So people are, two things, people are going to have to start perhaps working longer uh, to fill roles, to fill responsibilities, or secondly, um, we're going to have to start to accommodate them in this work environment. I think we all suffered a little bit of a hit to our 401ks in the last couple of years, and that might be also delaying some retirement plans for folks. So this is becoming even more immediate uh, of a problem. Let's take a quick poll. Um, roughly what percentage of your workforce is over 45 years of age? And I chose 45 because that's actually the age where human factors ergonomics professionals have identified that there are substantial changes that start to occur uh, in our workforce. So roughly what percentage of your workforce is over 45 years of age? Is it less than 10%? Is it about 25%? Closer to 50? Or is there a lot? Is it 75% or more? Just take a couple seconds and Mary, once it's filled up, uh, if you don't mind just sharing those with us, we can you can build some comments around it as well. And this is going to continue to be an issue going forward for, um, I would say, almost every industry. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I come into that uh, a lot of environments, whether it's industrial or, or office. And uh, hey, sometimes I find it easier to call them the, the chronologically gifted. The chronologically, the experienced. <laughs> That's right. Worker. But certainly it presents uh, a lot of different challenges. And, and we're about to share with you uh, uh, some of those direct changes that do occur physically um, to our bodies as, as we do uh, proceed in age. So Mary, what, what do we have so far? So 9% of the attendees said that 10% or less are 45 years of age or over. 37% said that 25% are. 50% said 50% are. And 4% said that 75% or more. Great. So Thanks. the main so, are 25 you know, we're, we're, and 50 percent over 45. Wow. Well, you know, we're this is sort of falling in line with this conversation is you know, and it's only going to get more and more of that percentage. Those populate that big uh, baby boomers and the echoes start to move forward. I'll be 40 this year, so I'm going to be there in five years, and my wife's going to be there. So we're it's a big group of people who are going to shift into this, this category of workers. So it's really important to uh, consider you know, what, uh, what we got to think about in the workplace. So Kev, take us on the next step. Yeah, and, and to that extent, you know, if you're kind of wondering where we start to see these changes, um, they can be broken down into two categories, above the shoulder or below the shoulder. And as it relates to below the shoulder, we see changes in strength, connective tissue, flexibility, uh, heat stress. Uh, and, and that we, we really um, have got a good handle on in terms of designing workplace, workstations, and equipment. Um, but one thing I wanted to share with you guys is what starts happening above the shoulder in relation to facility management and design of those workstations, particularly for office environments. Um, we see very big changes happening, particularly in the vision and cognitive ability. Uh, so if we were to specifically delve a little bit more into this, as humans, 85% of all the information that we gather is through the human eye. Okay? And we really rely on that as a primary source of how we digest the information, process it, and then make decisions. 
And so if you're thinking about task design or workstation design, uh, as we move up to 60 years of age, we need five to six times more light in order to uh, be able to perform at the same level as we would at the age of 20. The near point increases with age to 8.5 inches once we hit the age of 40. Uh, at and 25 years, it's 4 inches. Yeah. 25 years old, it's 4 inches. That's a big push. Got to get longer arms. More than double. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and also our accommodation declines after the age of 40. So the ability to accommodate, you know, going in from a light room to a dark room or changing screens or adjusting very quickly to changes of color. And of course with that as well is your visual reaction time also doubles. It's twice as long. That's correct. So that has a lot to do with uh, how we plan our spaces and, and, and when we say these are, when we put these numbers down, this means there's statistical significance behind the decline. It's not just a small decline. It's a, it's a big gap, big change in, in their ability to accommodate. The other thing I wanted to share with you all is that, uh, you know, given given today's topic and timing, uh, we were we thought we'd pull the, the key items out for you, but there are a plethora of studies and databases that uh, um, have outlined exactly what changes um, can occur. So we wanted to find the ones that you'd find most applicable. Now, we don't just want to tell you what the problems are. We'd like to help you solve some of them. So the typical improvements that are made uh, to enhance uh, visual type tasks and visual performance would be things such as increasing the font size and contrast. Uh, monitor the adjustability for optimal viewing distance. This is, you know, in relationship to your, you, maybe your touch screen or your, your viewing display, uh, particularly keeping in mind those that maybe are wearing bifocals, right? I need to be able to move it close and far away from me. Reduce the direct and reflected glare. Uh, because that will create eye fatigue and strain, potential headaches. It can also impact the neck postures. When I've got glare on my screen, I'm naturally going to want to move the position of my head and my neck uh, to accommodate for that. Increasing task illumination by 20%. So that additional task light or task lamp attached to the workstation uh, is shown to, to help supplement this effect. And again, you don't need those for everybody, but it might be a strong consideration for those who are more experienced. Absolutely. So some more examples of uh, you know equipment that's used to increase font size. You have your uh, screen magnifiers, uh, large print on keyboards. Don't forget that your smartphone technology also has an option to increase the text size as well. So take full advantage of that. You know uh, the companies out there are, are are knowing that this is a a key feature that they need to build into it. Um, so remind everyone that this is something you want to take advantage of. The other important aspect of the neck up or head up uh, changes uh, that occur relates to cognitive ability. So my ability to find, see, and discern is going to be negatively impacted with age. And so some common strategies that we can use as rules of design would be providing both visual and audio signals uh, to the operator or the human. This becomes particularly important for emergency situations. Uh, providing written and visual instruction, slowing that rate of information presentation. I mean, in, in general, you want to strengthen your signal, reduce your choices. Uh, and this is just going to allow us to be able to process that information and make those decisions as efficiently as possible. The other interesting uh, effect relating more to a physical uh, ability is reaction times. Um, at the age of 60 years, of, uh, age of 60 years, um, we require 150 percent more reaction time, uh, and this really uh, comes from a delayed startled reflex. Uh, our, our muscles don't work as quickly; uh, they don't react as well, and so we actually tend to rely on our vision versus muscular reflex. And what naturally occurs is there is increased trips and falls because of that loss of balance, um, but the devastating effects or consequences uh, are more severe because of increased skeletal fragility, uh, you know, natural degeneration of bones, uh, osteoporosis uh, is a perfect example of that. So this really speaks to when we have grade changes in our work environment, you know, stairs or slow rises or even the threshold of a doorway, we've really got to start to consider these things with, uh, with an aging workforce because it's more difficult for them to react to that loss of balance and the consequences will be much more harsh. 
Well, and hey, Jamie, I know you're into yoga, so uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, if you find yourself in some of these postures, you know, flexibility is another very important issue. Uh, our ligaments become less elastic, and that reduces our flexibility, and uh, also the water content decreases in, in our tendons. And so this eventually causes stiffer tissues uh, and uh, our ability to react or to perform or to bend and to reach, uh, we aren't as capable as we once were. So uh, another important consideration for, for the workforce. But no matter what age you are or where you work, whether it be telework or home officer or um, out of officer or in the traditional workplace, or if you happen to be an older worker or have a large population of older workers, you know, office ergonomics is, is really, really quite simple. Um, and we, we have developed this method called the four points of contact. And it's very, very basic. You only have to manage four things in an office workplace. They are how your eyes interact with, with sources, whether that be a screen or uh, documents how your hands interact with input devices such as keyboards or your mouse, how your body fits in your chair if you're seated, and uh, how your feet are interacting with the floor. And if you can manage these four things and, and follow very, very simple rules to set them up, you are going to be set up in the, in the best possible position given the, given the equipment that you have already at your disposal and that you provided your people. Uh, to uh, use. One more thing I'll add to this comment is that we assume that people know how to set up their workstation. Because, you know, we've all been working at computers for the last 20 years and it shouldn't be a problem, right? But the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that my wife, I walked into her office uh, actually last week to pick up a, well, we're running some errands. And uh, her, it was a disaster as far as I could see. And so we assume that people know how to set these things up. So education and simple education, I think, is, is very, very key. And, you know, Kev, why don't you take us through the four points and, and just show these basic setup rules. Sure, absolutely. Uh, generally speaking, when you start with uh, a hands-to-input device, these four elements here, a keyboard, uh, input device, avoiding contact stress, and minimizing reaches. So if we delve into these a little bit more deeply, as it relates to uh, having a proper keyboard support, you want to adjust the height to allow for those wrists to be in the most neutral position possible, avoiding the bending down, upwards, side to side, keeping uh, the keyboard and your wrists as close to the body to minimize that reaching or extended posture of the forearms and elbows. And you may also need to consider having a negative tilt to keep the wrist straight. That's where the top of the keyboard is actually tilted down and away from you. In regards to the keyboard's position, you know, I still don't understand fully why they include those flip legs on the keyboard because they are going to force you into an extended awkward wrist posture. So keep those legs flipped down and flat. Keep your wrist straight and your hands and arms should float. And what we mean by float is that when you're typing, you should not have your hands or your wrist resting on the edge of the work surface or on the keyboard, or even if you've got one of those nice gel pad rests. Those are only supposed to be used for taking a micro break uh, between typing tasks. So an ideal position is to have your hands and wrists floating as you type throughout the keyboard. And it's a little bit of a tricky technique to get used to doing. Regarding contact stress, this is when you are resting you know, soft tissue such as your hand, wrist, or your palm against a hard or a sharp surface. Uh, so you want to, uh, to round those surfaces, pad those surfaces, so that when you are taking a micro break, you're not occluding blood flow. You want to place frequently used items within a normal reach, so avoiding that extended elbow posture. Keep those less frequently used items further away from you, and I mean so far away that you're not tempted to just kind of bend over and, and reach while you're still sitting down, right? Force yourself to have to stand up or walk over. And don't let that clutter interfere so that you're unable to optimize the position of your keyboard or your mouse input device. Yeah, 90 pictures of the family might be a little excessive <laughs> on the desk. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that. Now, as it relates to body to chair, the second point of contact, uh, these are the variety of chair adjustments that you want to consider. Everything from seat pan height to armrest position. So if we move into these a little bit more specifically as it relates to the seat height adjustment, 
The key thing here is to keep your thighs parallel with the floor. Knees should be bent at 90 degrees, and that should also allow you to keep your hips with a slightly open angle. And as well, you want to make sure that your feet are flat on the floor. That's how you're going to know that your body, everywhere from the underneath of your thighs to the top of your shoulder blade, are well supported. The seat pan adjustment is also another important feature of the chair you want to consider. The space between the knee and the front of the chair while the back is supported should allow for about two to three fingers. And that's how you know that you're not either compressing the, the blood flow that's coming uh, underneath the thigh and through the knee, um, or also that the seat pan is too small such that it's only covering or supporting half of your thigh and now you're actually compressing the, the veins and the nerves that are in the larger section of the underbody of your thigh. Again, keeping in mind that you want your thighs to be parallel with the ground. The seat back rest adjustment is also a very important feature, uh, particularly with the lumbar support. And that needs to be able to match the natural S curve that uh, everybody's spine has. And so that backrest tension should support the user in that upright position and should lock in the upright position or allow a slight tilt. Okay, you don't want too much rocking going on in your back, uh, otherwise you may be um, not optimizing the support that you're providing. And then lastly with the armrest, well, I think one common myth out there is that I should be using the armrests constantly, and the more support I have from them, the better. Well, if your armrests are too high, your shoulders are going to be raised, and you're actually creating tension in your neck and your uh, upper shoulder muscles. So ideally, your armrests should be situated such that they have uh, just slight uh, uh, support on your forearms, but really they're there to provide full support for when you do take that micro break between typing or mousing. The other thing about an armrest is that a lot of people will sometimes take them off and, and remove them from the chair. And, and, you know, I don't think that's wise. I don't think it's wise for a couple reasons. Uh, one is they actually help you target your chair. So they help you when you're sitting down to center yourself over your chair and so you don't end up missing the chair completely or, or sitting on half of it and falling, uh, falling over. The second is, with the, especially with the aging workforce, the sit-to-stand movement for people, especially around a starting at about age 55, becomes increasingly difficult. It's just, oddly, there's two or three inches. The first two or three inches going from seated to standing are the hardest. And if we don't have a armrest to help us push ourselves up, the, 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 your, your more experienced workers might have, might have some difficulties getting out of the chair. So I, I like having armrests on chairs all the time for all populations, uh, but a specifically reason for, uh, for the aging group. Moving on to feet to floor, uh, the two things that you need to consider are having the appropriate chair adjustments, which we just reviewed, uh, and also uh, potentially considering the need for a footrest. Ideally, your feet should be flat on the floor or on the footrest. None of this, you know, on the balls of my feet or on my heels. Uh, you don't want to be sitting on your legs uh, or propping your feet uh, on the, the chair legs themselves. That's a, uh, position that is really not going to be ideal for optimal blood flow and overall comfort. Now with regards to a footrest, you really want to consider this only if the individual is unable to place their feet flat on the floor. Maybe they have to raise their chair to such a height to match the rest of the workstation and now their legs are unable to touch the floor. You should have height and just uh, an angle adjustment uh, as a part of that footrest uh, features. Uh, as well as consider that it may not be needed by everybody. Um, also, for those of you with the 8-inch stilettos, that may have an impact on the posture of which uh, your feet and your ankles and the rest of your legs um, will have. Now, the, the, the fourth point of contact is ice to source. And this relates to the position of your monitor, your source or reference documents, minimizing the glare, uh, as well as um, appropriate eye care. You firstly need to consider that having the monitor uh, to be vertically adjustable in height um, such that the top of the monitor is at eye level. The eyes naturally look from the horizontal horizon and down about 30 to 35 degrees. And so a really great test for yourself is to close your eyes and open them. And when you open those eyes, the first point on the screen you should see is about the top middle portion of the screen because your eyes naturally look downward without significant neck postures. 
If your monitor is too high, our eyes don't like to look up, and, and rather what we'll do is extend our neck and keep lifting our chin upward. The distance of the monitor is also another important consideration. As a general rule of thumb, an arm's length reach away uh, is, is something that you could follow, uh, but you do want to keep in mind that if I have um, the bifocals, then I really want to make sure that the adjustability feature of that support arm or articulating support can move forward and away um, depending on the task and my vision requirements. Regarding document holder, hey, that's going to completely depend on how much source documents are utilized. Uh, you can get them where they mount on the side of the monitor or there's a tray that sits between the keyboard and the monitor itself. But again, be mindful of those individuals that are wearing bifocal or transition lenses. Lastly, minimizing the glare is important. We touched on this earlier about the impact that it can have to arm or to neck postures. Uh, so make sure that it, the monitor is perpendicular to the source of glare. Uh, you do not want to place the monitor directly in front of a window. Cut down on that direct light and tilt the monitor slightly downwards to help reduce that glare. So that support of the monitor should allow the positive and negative tilt capability. Hey, you know, having regular eye exams is also a really important part of in kind of the preventive maintenance of uh, of our eye uh, um, habits and health. So, you know, consider the, the regular exams as well as lenses that are specifically uh, designed for uh, viewing computer uh, uh, tasks and information at distances and various environments. And then if you, you haven't heard of the rule 20-20-20, uh, essentially every 20 minutes uh, you want to look 20 feet away or an object that is 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And that has been shown to provide the eyes enough of a break to relax the muscles and reduce that overall eye fatigue and strain. Changes the focal length and then just those little muscles and just gives them that break. That's the key. Now, how do you drive this sort of information out to your to your people? Um, you know, I think I felt frustration from facilities managers to provide all this great equipment and still people just just, it just doesn't seem to work well. And, and I think it comes back to sort of my original message, and, and I'll blend it into how to leverage it with technology, is how to empower people to, to do it themselves. Because that's, you know, 80% of the people that you probably have in your facilities uh, don't have significant ergonomic concerns that they can't solve on their own. You might have some folks who have pre-existing conditions, who may need some special accommodations, and I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about the 80% of people out in your in your uh, organization who uh, who really it's just a matter of knowledge and, and empowering them to to solve their own issues. So, to me, there's there's four key steps to empowerment process, and and what you have to do is if you provide people education, they have to understand some basic principles and how to set their workstations up. Um, Give them a way to help them sort through the, the details, how to understand what really the issues are at their workstation. So a problem identification method is, is key. Um, give them solutions and give them access to them. Most of the equipment you provide is, is in my estimation, in most modern offices, is pretty, is pretty darn good. It's just the little things. It's the monitor risers. It's the um, uh, document holder. It's the keyboard support, uh, maybe. It's, 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 generally, it's generally not big investment kind of stuff. And finally, for your sake, make sure you have a way of documenting and verifying what people are doing and that they are understanding and that they are creating better workplaces and having some, some data management. And the nice thing is, is that if you went out on the web and, and looked up uh, online solutions, you would find that very there's, a, there's quite a few, some are better than others, uh, to help you roll out ergonomics in an efficient way. If you think about it, the online training or that learn portion, if you're looking at it and trying to evaluate it, should be simple. It should teach a few principles, help the person set them up in a systematic way, and also be interactive so that, you, so that they engage. You know, the last thing you want is to send out a video that nobody wants. And the last thing you want is to send out a an e-learning package where people can just click through and, and get through the training without actually have to learn. So make sure that there's built-in interactivity. 
in terms of that um, problem identification method, you know, you could use an online survey. Make sure that it's simple but comprehensive, and that's a gentle balance, but you don't have to ask 100 questions. I don't think you have to ask 50 questions. I think 25 questions or thereabouts is enough to help people identify what the major issues may or may not be in their workplace. And then link those issues to the solution. So if I answer no to my monitor isn't at the right height, then offer solutions to that, such as a monitor riser, uh, a ream of paper, uh, to a fully adjustable um, monitor. The key is that it provides you links and feedback and links them to some issues. And the last uh, piece is, for your sake as facilities managers, make sure it has a good database that's simple and, inner and uh, usable and very, very intuitive in, in use to help you make plans, monitor the situation, and create reports to understand, hey, what are generally are our themes of problems that we have out there? And, and what are generally people looking for solutions? Because then you can start to plan as you roll this out to more and more facilities, you can get better and, and, and have a better sense of what your budget requirements might be. But those are the three key things that an online solution really should have. It should have an online training, have a way of surveying people, and then have a back end that, that helps you manage, manage data. So I hope uh, we've got a little bit of time left. Uh, I hope we've covered this very, very broad topic. And, and 60 minutes is, uh, is not a long amount of time. But I hope we've been able to sort of show you what some trends are in the workplace, in the office workplace specifically, um, what those trends are causing in terms of new challenges for us as facility managers. Uh, also, a little bit of background on why standing versus sitting is why that debate is going on. And, and uh, why alternative seating perhaps isn't the best choice. Give you some, some key factors to help with that aging workforce. And I hope that simplified method to set up your workstation helps you in, in identifying uh, or helping people to set up their workstations as easily as possible. And finally, some ideas on that leveraging of new technology. But we're hope, happy to answer any questions that might come up. Um, please feel free to chat, uh, type them in in the chat. Mary, I think that's the right. Uh, right course of action, but we're, we're here. We've got another five minutes or so and, and happy to help. Someone asked, how does this fit with the new ADA rules? The American for Disability Act, uh, see the, uh, if, if I can answer that uh, question, in reference to any standards or any information that we've provided, all of the information that we've provided in terms of guidelines will suit all populations, um, whether they are disabled or not. Obviously, uh, when people are hearing impaired or vision impaired, that's a, that's a different level of disability. And this is this presentation was more for the general workforce or those with, uh, I hate to use the term, but um, slight disabilities or, or not not involving the senses. Perhaps they uh, they're they're confined to a wheelchair or perhaps um, uh, they have other paraplegic type activities. Well. Everything that we've provided um, is suitable for most populations, with the exception, Kevin, if you would agree, uh, people with vision or, or hearing impairments. Okay, someone asked another, oh, sorry, another question, if, you, if the PowerPoint would be available. Um, would yeah, you mind um, if, if I put it in PDF form and send it out? Would that be OK? Or? Um, actually, well, we have to remove some of the things that are in it, just, uh, for instance, the cartoons and stuff, because they're not ours to distribute. We can show them, but they're not ours to distribute. Okay. So if you want to uh, email me, uh, here's my email address, and I'd be happy to, happy to send them out, no problem. Okay, would you mind maybe um, removing the items and then get it back to me, then I can get it to the attendees, because I've had a couple people ask. Okay, sure, no problem. Okay. No problem. Okay, someone else said, thank you for citing, hold on, thank you for citing the products, it was a private message to me, Pro, the, so, so thank you for citing the, the sources for the current products manufacturers, what are the levels of liability does the facilities manager assume by doing these assessments ourselves? Um, I don't believe that there are, you, really liability is of of major concern because these are known guidelines. These are you're not prescribing a solution to someone who is injured. You're providing a 
workplace based on the best recommendations and the best known knowledge. Um, if you're, when you are dealing, this is where I'd say, for the general population, no issue of liability whatsoever. Because again, this isn't specific medical advice or specific advice to handle an injury. It's providing a work environment that minimizes the risks in the workplace. When you're dealing with people who have an injury or have some accommodation need, uh, that might be when you want to bring in a, a professional, whether that be a certified professional ergonomist uh, or a occupational therapist. Those are the, generally the two groups that are best able to help people who have uh, specific accommodation needs. Any other questions you see out there, uh, Mary? It says, I'm being told not to offer any accommodation as it will be admitting that the colleague has an issue. Yeah, again, I, I think that comes back to what Jamie had commented on uh, about, you know, what is the context of which the, uh, the accommodation is being made. Is this to a certain percent of the population that maybe um, does have a, an, an injury or, or a disability? Uh, and, and again, accommodation is, is very broad. I always say that I'm not trying to change the person. We are trying to change the workstation just to better enable task performance. Uh, if I, want my, I want my skilled workers to be able to perform at a world-class level. So that's what I'm trying to accommodate is that performance and not rather uh, trying to highlight that someone uh, is currently unable to do their job. Yeah, and that also is a situation where you're probably reacting to uh, an injury or a, a, a concern of an employee, and that sort of react. And what we've been mostly talking about is being proactive, providing these op options and solutions in advance so that these conditions uh, never show themselves. Um, when you're dealing with an individual who has an injury, as I said earlier, that accommodation, you, you've got a, you've got a, from a Occupational Safety and Health Administration standpoint, address it. You've got an employee who's a, saying that there's an issue. Perhaps that's the time to bring in a, a professional to do the assessment and, and really know what's needed and what's not. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, any other questions, uh, Mary? Yes, there was one that says, what are your thoughts regarding doctors who prescribe a chair by name? Uh, I don't know if that, uh, well, I think there are, without seeing the work and understanding the work, I, I think that um, that's a very limited view of the workplace. You know, frankly, most of the problems that occur at work, um, at, the, at the, the office workstation, aren't because of the chair. Um, because the, you got to think of the work that has four points of contact. you got to think of the workstation as a system. So. You know, I can have the best chair in the world, but my monitor is too low and my keyboard is too high, therefore I'm putting a lot of pressure on the neck and shoulder area. Again, that's, that has nothing to do with the chair. There are some chairs that are better than others. Um, and if I was to recommend, whenever we make recommendations for, on seating, for instance, we give what the uh, required features and adjustments are and what the ranges should be, and then three likely solutions, uh, three likely vendors who can provide that solution and the model numbers. So we're not, I mean, you know, we're not going to identify that a steel case chair uh, versus a Herman Miller chair versus a Hayworth chair, which one's better. We're just going to say, look, all these are viable seating candidates. They all have the adjustments that are, that will help this person or help this person's uh, situation. Please pick amongst this group. I don't know if that answered the question, but I, I, I always think you gotta, you got you to gotta look at the whole system. It's not just a chair. And when you do look at the chair, there's lots of options out there to help solve the problem. Okay, another question is, is there an OSHA definition on reasonable accommodation? Well, OSHA actually says that you have to um, Mitigate the risk where financially and technically feasible. You have to address it. If you can't address it because of, from like an engineering control, for instance, is a, uh, a new piece of equipment, for instance. If you can't do that because of economic reasons or uh, because of technical reasons, 
then you have to look to the next level of, of control. And the next level of control is administrative controls. So can I limit the person's exposure to that work or to that work situation so that they are uh, given a break from it so that their muscles can recover, so that their body can recover? The last uh, form of control, the hierarchy of controls, is um, personal protective equipment. And, and personal protective equipment really doesn't apply to ergonomics. So again, if you can't accommodate the situation for technical or financial reasons, and you can justify that, you can show that, then your next level is administrative controls, which would involve either work practice or work schedule modification. Those were some really great questions, and thanks, Mary, for facilitating them. Are there any others, Mary? We're happy to keep answering. Yes, there are some more. Okay, it says someone sent and said, I think the open space office environment is the best way to tackle these ongoing ergo issues. Unfortunately, many stakeholders don't see the benefit in doing so. Are there any studies that I could cite that might add me and aid me in the selling of this initiative? Are you looking at uh, open, was it open concept office versus? Yes, yes, we said open space office, open space office environment. Well, um, one of the, you know, it's unfortunate, but one of the, well, not unfortunate, but because people assume that it's for a reason, but Herman Miller and Steelcase do a lot of studies on this, so if you check out their website, they provide a lot of information on um, workspace utilization, uh, open concept design for uh, productivity, and um, uh, flexible work environments for um, what I'd call transient workers or workers who come in and out, you know, at, at odd times. Um, they have a lot of studies around that stuff. So if you went to Herman Miller or uh, Steelcase, uh, both would have uh, resources that might help you with that. Um, what's odd is that, you know, those are all, that's all in the frame of marketing, but those two companies tend to have fairly good science behind their study. Not very many academic uh, studies um, look at the impact of open concept offices on risk in the workplace. So you, you sort of got to go with, with what's available and, and I say uh, Steelcase and Herman Miller are, are, are good options there. Okay, what about providing a chair for people that exceed the capacity weight of 275 pounds? Yeah, great question and uh, that was a topic that uh, we, we didn't really uh, speak to that much and that's uh, the, the obesity uh, factor. Uh, and Absolutely. There are companies out there that are aware that, uh, you know, the, the weight of the person sitting in the chair may be different. And so um, there are chair designs out there that uh, facilitate this type of weight um, and uh, also the size. So, you, you know, the big and tall chairs, uh, um, larger seat pans that are wider, that have greater depth uh, um, adjustability. Um, larger their um, pneumatics are stronger yeah the whole deal um, one company to look at is all steel um, another broad resource would be alimed.com uh, they have some um, solutions that might help or at least a starting point to help you identify potential vendors Kev, do you I'm familiar with body built as oh, well body built yep absolutely they have a um, series for uh, special populations or the obese population so they're out there um, and they, they work. That's all the questions that I see. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for spending the hour with us. We're, we're happy to answer any other questions. If you have any, just you know, take down my email address. Feel hap happy and to uh, respond and would do so in pretty quick order. Um, and I'll send the uh, slide to you, Mary, and then you can disperse them to, uh, to everybody. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mary, and for everyone on the phone. All right. Every hope everyone has a great day.